um, really such a great supporter of the California Native Plant Society and a fellow in the Native Plant Society. And we always give him the hardest presentation. He's got to summarize all of this stuff, but he's always done it for us. He can do it now. Welcome, Bart O'Brien. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be back here again. Um, again, this is my home chapter. I'm still a member of this chapter. Uh, and was during my whole 24 years in LA. So, um, a long-term member of this chapter. And also just wanted to recognize too that we're at Foothill College, which was the, uh, where Bob Will, a uh, former horticulture instructor who was a former state president of CNPS, taught horticulture here. And Ellie Giamusis, one of our earlier chapter members, who actually started the native plantings here uh, called Native, native Hill. So uh, this place has a long connection to CNPS Santa Clara Valley chapter and to statewide CNPS. Uh, and also just the Santa Clara Valley chapter has always been one of the sort of small to medium sized chapters but has always had a larger than life uh, impact on the rest of the society, just because there's so many great people in this group. So, give yourselves a hand. <laughs> so, what I was really going to talk about uh, with all of the other speakers today, and I've really enjoyed all of these talks, they've been amazing. Uh, but about what can you actually do tomorrow uh, or later today if you're a late person like I am. Um, and I did want to just say though, yes, I am from the Regional Parks District uh, in the Berkeley Hills, uh, California Native Plant Garden, and actually it itself is the reason or one of the main reasons why there is a California Native Plant Society, uh, because when the Park District fired James Roof uh, and said they were going to move the garden, close the existing garden and move it to Anthony Chabot, uh, a bunch of people in Berkeley and uh, Contra Costa County uh, got together to save the Botanic Garden and get James Roof his job back. They were successful at both, and um, I remember talking with Jenny Fleming, one of the founders of our group, uh, I mean, a number of times later, and she said they had so much fun doing that that they decided that native plants needed more help everywhere so that they would just continue, and they founded CNPS in 1965. So, with that little history out of the way, what can you do tomorrow? You can plant, and we are in planting season, although it's pretty hot today. But there are a lot of things that come up when people think about planting, and I just wanted to cover some of them, especially as they relate to climate change and bigger issues. It is sort of what time frame. I think most of you are probably thinking October, uh, and that's correct, but also, if you think about what a lot of the various climate change scenarios say, that our area will be more like San Diego in like 50 years or so. And if you're planting all local natives, and you're not planting the real dry land natives, local natives, they are not going to be well adapted to our situation. So I think everyone needs to be thinking about native in a little bit broader term. Uh, and especially when you're thinking about longer term plantings, like trees. Uh, planting sycamores and maples right now is fine. You have, we have the water. But um, if we're San Diego and we have a lot less water, those probably are not my number one tree 
duties for our area. Uh, Buckeyes still would be. However, that's just one thing. How will you plant? Seeds. Seeds are always a great option, but very few people seem to use them as much. It's so much easier, and I mean, I will admit it too, I plant plants. Uh, but at the Botanic Garden, I do a lot of seeds. And it's because you can, you actually get a lot more diversity when you're dealing with plants from seed. And you can also experiment with more things. Again, if you're, uh, one of the things I think that's been sort of a trend with natives more lately is smaller and smaller planting sizes. Not only are they cheaper, but they're also a lot easier to plant. And so if you plant more and a bunch of them don't make it, it's sort of, oh well, you have more room to plant more. <laughs> uh, and again, it is what we all typically want to do anyway. So again, seeds, cuttings, divisions, containers, all of them have different issues. I'm sure some of you have heard about the various uh, soil-borne pathogens, Phytophthoras, and the concerns about nursery plants. And certainly it's a real concern. It's something I wrote about as long ago as 2001 for Chromantia. Um, so it's something that now is being taken very seriously and we're even getting some places very much overreacting to it. Um, I guess as I was talking with someone up here uh, over lunch, that it's something that you really need to be thinking even longer term when you think about some of these problems that we have. It's that uh, a very well-known plant pathologist came and visited our botanic garden and to look at a lot of our pathogens and um, at the end of the tour, as he was saying, yeah, oh, that's got that, oh, that's got that. Oh, those are gonna die real soon because they're at the end of their lifespan. You know, and it's sort of, yes, yes, yes. And then he said, but you know, you have a beautiful garden. And in 40 years, in 50 years, you are still going to have a beautiful garden. It's just going to be different. And I think that's what everyone needs to be thinking about. You probably already have a beautiful garden. You will change your garden, and it will still be beautiful, but it probably won't be the garden you have today. And that's fine. So, again, if you want to still plant from containers or from division or from cuttings or seeds, it's all fun. You know what the issues are, and Act accordingly. If you're adjacent to some really important, critically endangered species, you know, be more conservative. If you're in downtown San Jose, probably not so much. And from where? Where is sort of the big issue in the room? Because it is, what is native in climate change? So, always, no one's going to complain if you plant local plants. Uh, everyone understands uh, the idea of celebrating what's local and that local plants are, at least in theory, the best adapted to local conditions. The thing is, as we all know, local conditions are rapidly changing and that they're changing at a pace that a lot of plant natural migration cannot cope with. So again, it's local now. It's probably going to be local for almost all of us in this room for our lifetimes. But for the next generation, local plants may look a lot different. And again, if you look around your neighborhood or look at um, look at what is there and what's thriving with minimal or no care, those are always going to be good choices for your garden, uh, especially if you don't want to be giving it a lot of extra water or a lot of extra help. And again, 
goes without saying. Just because it's a native plant growing in a local native plant garden doesn't make it a local native. I think almost everybody has seen Formanodendrons, Carpentarias, Romnia culturized, spectacular natives. Uh, but they're really not local natives, or not very. And again, as a local native, uh, and uh, from Liam's talk, uh, areogonums. Areogonums are always good plants, and there are lots and lots and lots of them, uh, and many of them are extremely popular with pollinators, but it's interesting, even yesterday when I was at the Botanic Garden, and I actually even took a short movie on my camera, of Areogonum fasciculatum polifolium, just covered with all kinds of different insects, all working the flower heads. Right across the path was Areogonum cinerium, a much bigger plant, also in full bloom, and there were only like two or three honeybees on it, and that was it. Why? I have no idea. Usually buckwheats are popular with everything. Uh, but, for whatever reason, yesterday, they all wanted to go to the other plant that was much smaller. So, and also in back there, you also see uh, Artemisia uh, pycnocephala uh, and inflorescence there, uh, which is again another wonderful uh, comp, comp, which again, Aspiraceae are also great pollinator plants. So what most of us do as gardeners is assisted migration, whether we really think of it that way or not. Uh, assisted migration has been out there as a discussion topic, especially as it relates to climate change and how do we help plants move from point A to point B when the uh, natural mechanisms aren't going to get them there. Um, it is something that there's a lot of discussion about and not a lot of consensus. Um, but it's something that we as gardeners, like I said, we do it all the time. If you have Romnia, you are assisting it migrating north. Um, but in this particular scenario, the first one I have here, is about pipevine swallowtail. As many of you know, we're at sort of the south end of its natural distribution. And that uh, San Bruno Mountain and, uh, and in the East Bay around the Knoll are about as far south as that plant naturally occurs. And that is sort of where the butterfly sort of stops. Um, but yet, a lot of people are planting Aristolochia further south. And where I used to be, at Rancho Santa Ana, there was about an acre of it along the slope um, of Indian Hill Mesa. And at some point, somebody uh, introduced caterpillars of pipevine swallowtail to that location. And for about a decade, there were literally hundreds and hundreds of pipevine swallowtails throughout Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, nectaring on all these interesting uh, areophyllums and uh, areodictyons. Um, actually, their favorite plant was Areodictyon sessilifolium, a Baja California endemic, uh, which again, so these things are, are uh, opportunistic. But then uh, they eventually ate the plant almost out of existence, and the population crashed, and now you see very few of them. So I'm not really so sure about helping Aristolochia further south into San Jose, because again, most likely scenarios are that Aristolochia will go north, not south. Uh, and the butterfly will go north with it, and so the plant should be planted more north, uh, not more south. Again, that's just uh, a thought. So 
something to think about when you are sort of enhancing the environment for something. Is it something that's appropriate to go in that direction longer term? And if it's just going to be short term, what's the benefit of that? And again, Aristolochia is one of our few native vines, so a lot of people use it just as a vine. It's very attractive. The flowers in usually January, February. There are a few different color forms of it available. And then again, the beautiful, that's the male butterfly, the caterpillars, the eggs. Uh, again, a beautiful, beautiful animal. And they're a fun plant to have, or a fun butterfly and a fun plant to have. And we have them at the Botanic Garden were in their natural range. For this one, again, it is sort of, when you're looking at what is native in 50 or 100 years with climate change and warmer temperatures, it's sort of what do you think about? Where are they going to come from? Where should they be coming from? And I've thought about this many times, especially when I lived in Southern California. It's typically where I did most of my collecting activity, was out in the Eastern Mojave, because the plants can adapt to either summer rains or winter rains. They can also take extreme heat and extreme drought. What more could you ask for? Uh, especially when everyone talks about hotter, colder, drier. Uh, so that's one of the top. And if you really think about a lot of the San Joaquin Valley and the foothills surrounding it, they really are already steppe or, uh, Met or um, Mojave Desert type environments. And even when you look around the Mo of, uh, San Joaquin Valley, if you go down I-5, there are all of those remnant sand dunes uh, to the west. Uh, that harbor Enothera deltoides and a lot of the other desert annuals and perennials, tetrademias and so on. Uh, so they're already here. Antioch Dunes Evening Primrose is another Enothera deltoides howleyi. Uh, so again, it's, it's already up here uh, and already adapted to hotter, drier conditions although it's one of the first plants that was listed as federally endangered because all of its sand was mined away to become cement and concrete. Uh, but so those two areas are natural. The other third is the south end of the California floristic province in Baja. And that's specifically for that adaptability to rain whenever it so happens. Uh, if you think of Verbena lilacina that many people have in their gardens from Carol Bornstein's uh, De Lamina selection or others, uh, that that plant is adapted to water whenever it gets it. You can water it all the time in your garden, it flowers all the time. You can grow it completely dry and it will only flower after it rains. <laughs> Um, these are sort of some of the plants that should be looked at as sort of future natives to our area. And uh, there are many others down there as well. And parts of the Great Basin, particularly the western parts, uh, again, with, even with warmer temperatures, we're supposed to still get occasional big freezes. Uh, like we had in 2013 and in 1990 up here was the last really big freeze uh, that I can think of. Um, and so occasionally we will get these big freezes and they will take out some of these plants that aren't adapted to colder conditions. Uh, and so again, that's more reason to be looking at Easter Mojave, San Joaquin Valley, and Great Basin. And again, these plants do very well here. Think about uh, Great Basin sagebrush. Beautiful plant for our region. And it also brings age to your garden because it has those big gnarly trunks in very short amount of time. And it flowers a lot, so you get a lot of pollinators. Uh, 
So lots and lots of choices. But one of the ones I wanted to talk about in particular, because there are a lot of them, is Chalopsis. Chalopsis is from our low desert as well as the Mojave Desert. You can find it out in the Eastern Mojave, uh, the Clark Mountains and other places. Uh, and there are many horticultural selections that have been made. I noticed that in, uh, in the previous presentation, it was listed as number 43. Uh, in the second column, uh, which I did not know when I chose to talk about it, but I figured it should be <laughs> somewhere up there uh, because it is visited by all kinds of different uh, insects and hummingbirds and so forth. It's a great plant, uh, and yet it's very little seen in most gardens, and there are some great selections out there. So I wanted to just show you a few of them. I mean, this is the one that's been around probably the longest, and its real name is Burgundy, but sometimes you see it as Burgundy Lace. And it's got huge, deep purple flowers. And you can see uh, they all have stems with buds off of the sides so that they flower almost like rhododendrons in trusses or short groups of flowers that are oftentimes open at the same time, but not really a truss like a rhododendron. That's another one that's very well known because it has broader, darker green foliage and again, large flowers, and that's Bubba. Uh, Bubba wasn't selected from California. It, it's a, not surprisingly, was selected in Texas uh, from the San Antonio Botanic Garden. But yet, it is our same native species, uh, uh, Chalopsis linearis. And there are a lot of variations in these flowers. That's what I'm trying to get across here. And that it is sort of the point that many things in our flora and why I know I've said it many times in the past, the reason I like working with our native flora more than any, uh, anything else is you have the whole genetic heritage to look at here. You don't have to go to China. You don't have to go to Chile. You don't have to go to South Africa. These things are here and you can look for them and find them and bring back cuttings or seed and see how they do for you. Regal uh, is a beautiful bicolor form with very large flowers, and all of these very freely bloom. And the other thing that most people don't know about Chalopsis, because again, it is Easter Mojave, and all the way down through the Chihuahua Desert, is it's totally adaptable to rainfall at any time. And so, and yet it's very drought tolerant when it's established. You can bring it into flower almost whenever you want. You give it a really deep watering in warm season, and you get flowers in about two weeks later. And if you then water it again, you'll get another wave of flowers. And you can do this all summer long if you want to. At Rancho Santa Ana, I have a large collection of these, and I could keep them in flower basically from April through November in a good year. It is a deciduous plant, however. And Mesquite Valley Pink, with sort of these uh, overall pink flowers. And again, showing that habit of having a bunch of flowers open at once, and yet a lot of flower buds still coming. And Warren Jones. Warren Jones has one of the biggest flowers in the group, and it also tends to be evergreen whereas all the other ones are definitely deciduous. Sometimes in super cold winters, it will lose most of its leaves, but it does not go fully dormant, uh, which is unlike all the rest. There are also pure white ones. Oh, also that flower is about the biggest. It's about, oh, it's definitely bigger than an old-fashioned silver dollar. And when there are a bunch of them open, you know, they're, they're very noticeable. There is a white flowered form that I don't have a good photo of called White Storm, 
Uh, so they do come in colors from pure white to deep purple with all sorts of gradations in between as well as bicolors. At the opposite end of the range from um, Aristolochia, which is at its southernmost point in the Bay Area, Archistapolis Glauca is actually at the northern end of its range in our region and around Mount Diablo and the vicinity. It is one of the nicest manzanitas for gardens. This one is at a friend's house in Eagle Rock in LA. And that plant, as you can see, is taller than the house. How old do you think that plant is? Three years. It's, it's 12. Um, again, it was planted small and just kind of neglected off to the side corner and off it went. Uh, and it does get pruned back fairly hard from the neighbor's house on the other side. But uh, it is a spectacular plant. I had planted one in front of my house in Upland when I lived down there. And it is just a spectacular manzanita. Up here, we tend to grow Arctostaphylus uh, manzanita for our big manzanitas. But with climate change, this one is the one everyone should be looking at for longer term, uh, more so. And again, probably from either the ones from San Benito County, Santa Clara County, or, uh, or Contra Costa County. It is, it is one of the most beautiful manzanitas, in my opinion, the big berry manzanita. The other thing to be thinking about is water. And many of you probably know exactly where this is taken. It's taken just to the west of here, uh, at Betsy Kletch's house. And this is uh, Salvia B's Bliss, and that's Salvia sonomensis. And this is them, what they look like sort of now, with no water whatsoever. Uh, sonomensis is pretty much goes to nothing. Uh, whoops, whereas, uh, whoa. Whereas um, Bee's Bliss, damn. <laughs> so, um, Bee's Bliss is still very much visually there, even with absolutely no water. So again, think about how you're going to be watering or if you're going to be watering. One of the things I've always said about California is we are so incredibly spoiled with our engineered water systems and the super cheap availability of water. And most of us in the Bay Area have extremely good water quality Many of us get our water really from the Sierra, uh, which is why we have such good water quality. But uh, sooner or later, there will be a time when water is as expensive as it should be, which is probably 10 or 100 times more than we actually pay. Uh, and if you look at the world's other Mediterranean climates, they are all much, much, much better at water management than we are. Uh, when you look at parts of uh, Southern Australia and Western Australia, which is, which is the place sort of for all of those water storage tank ideas and rain barrels and cisterns, all that stuff came through their, what, water for a smart continent. Uh, which, again, it would be great if we just had water for a smart state um, that really recognized the value and importance of water and water quality. But it is something that many people do put in automated systems. I've never, ever liked automated systems. Our plants don't particularly like automated <laughs> systems. And even the ones that are talked about as being climate sensitive, it's usually after the fact. It's that 
oh, it was really, really hot today, so I'm going to turn on the water. What happens to many of our plants when they get water during hot days? They die. Uh, they want water a couple of days beforehand so that they're basically dried out enough that they're not going to get all these soil fungal pathogens uh, activated or crown rots or whatever. Uh, so I, I almost never will water my plants, even in pots, on really hot days. I'll water before or I'll water after. Um, and when you do have automated systems, that's usually not a choice. It's, it's Wednesday, it's 10 o'clock, they're going off. <laughs> or it rained today, so it's not going off. But it was also a Santa Ana wind or a Diablo wind. So you need to be able to override any such systems very easily, uh, in my opinion. So, um, that's probably enough on water. But again, salvias are some of our real workhorse plants. And as, as was in the latest Bee Talk, they were number one. And that's why they flower and flower and flower and flower and flower. Uh, and um, are just really popular with all kinds of insects. Uh, with uh, Sonomensis and uh, Bees Bliss and a number of the other uh, similar sorts of low growing species with the tall spikes, uh, are also very popular with many butterflies. Um, at the Botanic Garden, we oftentimes see swallowtail butterflies nectaring on. Uh, the Sonomensis and Sonomensis sorts, uh, they're just great plants, and they're so easy to grow. However, Sonomensis can be, itself can be fussy, unless you're on really mineral soil. But Bees Bliss, one of the best. So one of the other things you can do today or tomorrow or the next day and on forever is weed. Um, there are so many weedy plants and that one of the things that I put down here is gorilla gardening, weeding of the public commons. It's that we all have seen those few uh, brooms that have been allowed to come down the roads and travel and yet very few of us will actually stop and pull up the leading edge of them. Uh, to keep them in check or to eliminate them 10 years ago when there was just one or two. Uh, it's usually when broom bashing happens, it's, there's already a thousand of them and there's already a huge seed bank that then you're going to be fighting for years. But that's one of the things that you all know from Edgewood Park and the weeding there. It's a long-term commitment, it's a lot of work, but it is possible and you can really eliminate anything if you put your mind to it. So do keep that in mind, especially with some of these problematic weedy, woody plants. We're looking at acacia, eucalyptus, and a bunch of those sorts of things, as well as brooms, uh, just because they affect so much land. Uh, smaller things, yes, they really bother me a lot, but um, they're a lot more work to take on in many cases. The other thing is that there's also equally weedy wildlife. And here in the Bay Area, to me, it's deer. Deer have had such a negative impact on our quote-unquote natural areas simply because there's not enough predators, there's way too many of them, and so when was the last time you know of anybody finding a Cypripedium orchid anywhere in the Santa Cruz Mountains? Yet, they're in all the floras as being here, or they were, uh, until these things happen. Or even something that used to be fairly locally common, uh, Lilium partilinum. Uh, there are still some, but there's nowhere near what there was or should be, and it's because, again, they're very palatable to deer. Um, so 
it's, and yes, there's pigs, and actually, uh, the deer equals pigs on stilts. I always liked that. That was something that I think uh, the East Bay uh, horticulturalist Myrtle Wolf coined that. Um, and I've always just liked that, because it's very apt. I mean, everyone sees the damage that pigs do and don't excuse it. Many times people see all the damage deer do, but it's deer, and they have those big brown eyes, and they're, they've got the nice fur. Uh, but no, they just need to go away, or become more the rare items that they should be in our landscapes. Um, similarly, I know there's a lot of people who really like opossums. Uh, they're not native either. Uh, and yes, I know they've eaten all of the snails and many of the slugs in my yard, which I really like, but I, I don't know. The snails aren't native either. <laughs> so, it's also just aggressively remove and control weeds and do use the principles of IPM. Don't start with herbicides, but Herbicides aren't the end of the world if that's the best choice of getting rid of that poison oak plant that has a six or eight inch diameter trunk on it because it's been there forever. Um, you're not going to, or you can dig it out or do something else to it, but would you rather do that or would you rather just paint on the freshly cut stump and have it not come back? Uh, whether it's garlon or whatever. Uh, so again, keep things in proportion. Weeds, fennel. Although yes, fennel is uh, the anise, swallowtail, butterfly's principal food these days. But think of all of the nice lomations and angelicas and other APA say that they really should be eating, and that's what they were all eating. <coughs> and peridurideas. Yeah. yeah. So, research, record, and share. Do ask questions. Do keep notes on what you're doing, because it's always so interesting that Oh, wow, that thing really reacted really well. Hmm, what did I do to it? Yeah. Uh, did I cut it back only, or did I cut it back and then just put a little bit of nitrogen on it? Or did I, whatever. Uh, if you don't keep notes, you won't remember, uh, even though you're absolutely sure you will. Or it's, where did that plant come from? Um, in my yard in Upland, I would regularly just let things seed in because I was a few couple of miles from some from the base of the uh, of the San Gabriel Mountains, and occasionally I would end up with Artemisia californica plants coming up, and I would almost always leave them, and then I would uh, treat them horticulturally. I would prune them back hard in the winter; they come back great. And again, the neighbors would always say, ooh, what's that ugly plant in your yard? Why do you have these dead plants there in the middle of summer? And then when I cut them back and they come back and they're all really lush and lacy and it's, ooh, where could I buy that plant? You know, same thing. Uh, so again, just keep track of what you do. The other thing is, um, don't be afraid of cultivars. Almost all of the California native plant cultivars have known wild origins. Not all, but almost all, the vast majority of them, with the exception of some of the hybrid irises, which are really complicated, long, long, long hybrid uh, lineages. Uh, but almost every manzanita, almost every ceanothus, uh, we basically know where they came from. And again, if you do your research, you can find out where they came from too. So um, I know that uh, for Carolyn 
Dave and my book, The California Native Plants for the Garden, uh, on Amazon, of course we read the reviews, and one of them said, the book is all cultivars, and cultivars don't do anything for pollinators. Wrong. Um, wrong on so many levels. Uh, but again, there are people that are afraid of cultivars just because they happen to have a different name on them. All it means is that somebody liked it and thought that somebody else might also. Uh, that's how cultivars originate. Sometimes they're breeding programs, but for most of our natives, they're not. Uh, there, somebody saw it, somebody liked it, they took cuttings, it grew, and they decided to name it and share it. So, don't be afraid of cultivars. Much like this, from Anadendron, California, Butano Ridge. Where's it from? Butano Ridge. <laughs> uh, there's only three from Anadendrons individuals in San Mateo County. This is one of them. So if you're in San Mateo County and you want to plant an appropriate for monodendron, pretty much that's it. And it's a really nice plant. It's got bright red new growth and, and nice lemon yellow flowers. However, if you want a formatodendron that will just grow, and not get too big, uh, Dara's Gold. This is a decumbens Mexicanum cross done by Dara Emery at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden deliberately that actually is one of the easier low ones to grow. It typically doesn't get taller than this table and usually it's about six feet or so across, has small yellow flowers. It's really a good size for most gardens. Unlike Pacific Sunset, which would fill from that wall to that wall and to the ceiling. Another plant, um, Chuparosa. I know that Chuparosa couldn't be grown at Tilden, or so everyone had said. Um, and yet, this plant is at Tilden uh, in our botanic garden. It's actually a selection that was made from Deep Canyon near Palm Springs. You know, that, that uh, anyone who's a birder probably knows that book, The Birds of Deep Canyon. Uh, it's a UC preserve. Anyway, this was collected there many, many, many years ago. It's a bright yellow form, and it's very easy to grow and apparently much more adaptable than people thought. I like a lot of tar weeds, and it's they're great plants for gardens because they flower late and they flower for a long time, and you get all kinds of insect visitors. And if you plant one like Minthornii, which is from the Santa Susana Mountains, uh, it's perennial. You don't have to collect seeds. You don't have to worry. It just is always there. Uh, they're very long-lived plants. It's not sort of a showstopper, but if you think of this with zauchnerias or epilobiums, whatever you want to call them, uh, as late season color and mix in a few uh, buckwheats, you've got a whole late summer and full fall planting that blooms And again, there's so many late blooming Asteraceae in California, and they're all very critical to so many insects and other wildlife. This is just Hazardia cana uh, from the Channel Islands. This particular one was seed that I collected on Guadalupe Island off of Baja. Uh, what I like about them, in addition to just the great white color, gray white color, is the flower buds. I mean, they look almost like pine cones. Uh, and then when the flowers open, they're not spectacular, but again, there's almost always insects on them because they don't have a lot of choices 
at this time of year. Buckwheats, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people have talked about them. Uh, just great garden plants, great insect plants, uh, many beneficial insects like buckwheats a lot. Uh, and this one is crocatum that's been in cultivation for what, over 100 years now, easy. It's one of the plants Theodore Payne introduced originally uh, with the wonderful gray foliage. Just from around the, uh, what is that, the west end of the Santa Monica Mountains on volcanics. Uh, and what? Conejo Pass. Yeah, Conejo Gray. Uh, it's, and it does have that really unusual sort of yellow green color. Uh, this is one of the few buckwheats that everything completely shatters as it dries. So many of our buckwheats stay intact uh, and provide additional color for a long season. These actually turn black and drop off. Cacciella is another one that I think is sort of an unsung hero, uh, particularly for the Bay Area. Uh, in Southern California, it goes completely dormant shortly after it flowers in June. Uh, it's completely uh, in sync with the hot, dry climate. Up here, they just come into flower in that time, and then they just keep flowering. I just took that picture like two weeks ago uh, at, at our garden. And again, there are many different color forms. Uh, there's yellows, there's oranges, as well as these sort of reds. Uh, and it's a plant that you can grow it separately or you can grow it inside something else. Um, in particular, um, I like growing them in Ceanothus. Because, again, the Ceanothus are all done, uh, but they provide structure. Salvias. I don't have very many things left. Usually I show tons and tons of plants, as you know. Uh, but Salvia Clevelandii, again, great plant for pollinators, like all of the salvias. Monardellas, uh, a lot of people have trouble growing this one, and it's probably because you're growing it too hot and too dry. Uh, it does want more partial shade. That's it at our botanic garden in one of the troughs out in front of the visitor center. So it gets about at least half day shade and never gets hot. We cut it back in the winter and give it a light fertilizer because it's in a container. But I wanted to share a couple of new things at the botanic garden from, the, from Southern California. This is actually from uh, the Santa Rosa Mountains, so again, above Palm Springs, but up where it snows. Uh, this is Monardella nana. Uh, this is a little rock garden or container plant. That whole plant is maybe six inches across, uh, but those flowers are, again, a, a bit bigger than silver dollar, uh, the old-fashioned silver dollars. Uh, and it's been in bloom for about the last three months. This was something that we got this spring in March as cuttings. Uh, they've just done phenomenally well. And with it, or well, here's a close-up. It's really a gorgeous little plant uh, with the white wraps, white petals, and pink pollen. Hummingbirds visit it, as well as moths. And then from the Eastern Mojave, uh, Penstemon Thompsonae. This is, uh, again, a little tiny shrublet, usually no higher than about six or eight inches max by about up to a foot across. And again, this is from cuttings that we took this spring in this in May, first week of May. Uh, and already they're full-size plants and they're blooming right now. I, I mean, I took these pictures just last week. Good for containers? Yes, uh, very good for containers. 
There it is in a container. <laughs> Um, and again, it's something that um, the Eastern Mojave and some of the higher ranges where it gets colder, these are places where we should be looking for plants to add to our native plantings in the Bay Area. And then I just have a couple of more uh, to close out. And that's uh, two annuals. Uh, Streptanthus farnsworthianus, which is a fairly rare Streptanthus, but it's actually, I mean, what you're looking at there are the bracts and the foliage. The flowers are these little tiny white things. It's kind of, oh, who cares about them? Uh, when you have this much other stuff to look at. And that that plant is, from the tabletop, is about this tall. So it's a, a very notable plant from the Sierra foothills. And it's very easy to grow. Uh, Ginny Hunt had given me seeds of this, and we had planted them out, and they did well. And so then they got planted out in the Sierra and Granite Mound, and the, they just took off. And that's what they did this spring. And then just locally, uh, just up on Skyline Boulevard, uh, you have uh, one of our Bay Area spectacular Clarkias, Clarkia rubicunda, but you have an interesting form up on, or we have, I mean, I used to live here too, uh, uh, that, uh, that's up there that I have no idea if it's uh, or why it's there. I mean, that's the hillside, uh, and again, it's, it's basically from Windy Hill to Rapley Ranch Road, uh, where you get these sort of almost orange-centered ones that are just mixed in with the rest. And you can see there's one there, but there's a typical Rubicunda. There's another one. There's one. They're just random. And whether that's something that's just um, something that's um, a mutation, a rare mutation that's stabilizing, increasing, who knows? I have no idea. I just know I've noticed it for many years, and it's still there. Uh, and I probably will try to grow it at some point relatively soon. It's a climate change. <laughs> who knows? So, I did want to also, though, mention there are other ways of gardening. Um, many people garden with rock. Many people are rock gardeners at a different scale. But this is one of those, or this, a style of gardening that's come out of Eastern Europe. And this is now our version of it, a crevice garden. Uh, that we just have under construction um, as of July, and it'll be done, well, we can only work on it during July and June, when things are, soil's dry enough, and so on and so on. But the, um, it is something that you can do a lot of diversity in a very small area, because what you do is different soil mixes in the crevices. And these are long pieces of rock. The rock pieces are frequently this big. Uh, and so a lot of it is buried. And so you have all these pockets that you can put whatever you want in them. Uh, and plant plants that want to be in that sort of wetter mix, drier mix, whatever you want to do. And that's looking up it, and that's looking at it from the side. Uh, that's also in the Sierra section. So something to look at next time you come to the Botanic Garden to visit. And because it wasn't mentioned earlier with plants and plant sales, we have our plant sale coming up in two weeks, um, October 5th. So if anybody is inclined to come up uh, from uh, 10 to 3, it's public sale. From 9 to 10, it's members only. I did bring a bunch of back issues of, of one of our journals, Manzanita, and uh, 
Uh, I'll leave these, which are one of each one that I brought in, up here. Please come and take them. And that's it. Thank you very much.